No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you'll always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today. I want to thank you for joining us. And we've got a great program today. Here's what's coming up. We're going to begin with our devotional time, and that consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of that scripture. Today we'll be looking at Romans 15.4, a passage where we learn about how to properly use the Old Testament. So get out your Bibles, turn to Romans 15. I'll meet you there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, Troy Spradlin joins us from his workshop, where he's going to be repairing our understanding about the subject that is misunderstood by most. He'll be talking about the Ten Commandments. Jim Dearman will join us with some sound words about seeking excellence. We'll head back over to the pastime porch where Joe Guy is armoring our minds as he brings us another truth from the timeless text. Chad Dollahite joins us for just a minute, and he's encouraging us to do less interpretation and more imitation. In our final segment, we have a Bible question for Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin. Why did God allow King David to marry Bathsheba after committing adultery and premeditated murder? That's a great question and they'll be answering it from the Bible in just a few moments. Well, I hope you have your Bibles opened up to Romans chapter 15, where we read verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. passage for today comes from the book of Romans, Paul's inspired letter to those Christians there in Rome. And it's a letter that's filled with doctrine. And as he talks about that, he comes to the conclusion uh, in chapter 1 that uh, Gentiles have been lost. In chapter 2, that the Jews have been lost. In chapter 3, since everybody's either a Jew or a Gentile, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, so that's the premise upon which the book builds. And salvation is now available to us through Christ. And, and as he works through, we get to a, a practical section of the book. And that is, uh, here, how do we show our love to our brethren? In chapter 14, he's encouraged them uh, not to cause their brother to stumble by their actions. The things that they do could trip up somebody else. Don't allow that to happen. And he says, Christ didn't live to please himself, but he lived to serve other, others. And, and he throws in a quote there from Psalm 69. And our passage for today tells us things that were written before time were written for our learning. This would be the passages from the Old Testament. And he's spent a lot of time so far in the book showing that the Old Testament law doesn't apply anymore. You see, Christ is the end of the law, Romans chapter 10, verse 4. So what use is the Old Testament to us? You see, he's going to go on several points in, the next, in this chapter. He's going to be quoting from the Old Testament. What good is that? Well, there's a few things we get from the Old Testament. Number one, we see God's power. We see His ability to do the miraculous. With the word of His mouth, He brought about the creation of the universe. He parted the Red Sea, the, the ten plagues in, in Egypt, and the miracles just went on and on. We see His absolute power. 
But we also see in the Old Testament God's ability to bring about His will without miracles. Like in the book of of Esther, there was no miracles that we see there. But we see God's providential working throughout the entire book. In the Old Testament, we also see God's plan. God has been working to bring about man's redemption, his eternal purpose, we read in chapter 3, verse 11, the book of Ephesians. God's working this plan. He made promises, starting back there in, in Genesis 3.15, Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and on throughout the Old Testament. Different people, promises were made to them. And he gave prophecies to the prophets, again, pointing to the Christ that was to come. We also see in the Old Testament God's persistence. Men continually fail him, but he continued to work his plan. For instance, uh, God wanted to be Israel's king for Samuel 8, 7, but they refused and asked for a different king. He still worked with them, and he was working successfully to bring Christ to save mankind. We also see God's patience in the Old Testament. It took God time to bring it all about, but he had patience. It was thousands of years. Like he had patience, we need to emulate that and have patience as well. Patience with him when it comes to answering our prayers, and patience with others. That's a key point here in this context, that we need to be patient with our brethren. That was the point of Jesus' parable about the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18. You see, that servant had been forgiven 10,000 talents. That would be about $12 million U.S. And he wouldn't forgive somebody who owed him just a few hundred dollars. So there was a big difference. That was the point. You need to be patient with your brethren. The Scriptures also give us comfort. Comfort knowing that God is the one who's in control. He cares for His people, sometimes even more than we care for ourselves. That is very comforting to know that He cares that much about us. And He gives us hope. That hope keeps us pointed in the direction of heaven. If God works so patiently throughout the Old Testament, so diligently to bring about your salvation, do you think He wants you to achieve it? Of course He does. And that's the point. So as we seek to apply this passage, we understand we don't follow the Old Testament law, but we need to learn from the Old Testament. It's useful to us to help us understand about God and His plan and the patience that He has with man. That is good news for us today. Well, it's time for us to head over to the workshop where Troy Spradlin will be repairing our understanding about something that we find in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments. Are we still under that law today? There's one subject at the heart of much religious confusion is that many people do not fully comprehend the distinction between the Old and New Testaments. And if you don't believe it, just try telling one of your religious friends that Christians are not subject to the Ten Commandments and then wait for their reaction. You know, most are going to become rather upset with you very quickly. In fact, some of our own brethren within the church might even get upset with you. So you can expect to hear something like, what do you mean we are under the Ten Commandments? Are you saying it's okay to murder? Well, of course, murder is still wrong, but not because the Ten Commandments say it. So why do people get so upset? Well, it's usually because they don't understand the biblical concept of old versus new covenants. So, let's repair our understanding about this subject. You start by looking at the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, when He says, This cup is the new covenant in My blood, which is shed for you. We should then consider Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 24 through 25, which illustrates that the law, that is, the Old Testament, has fulfilled its purpose and we are no longer under it. There are several more verses, such as Colossians 2, verse 14 through 17, Romans 7, 6, and, and Romans 8, 1 through 2, and Hebrews 7, 22, all that explain that the Old Covenant, that, that old pact, 
which is another word for testament, by the way, has been replaced with the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2. So if Jesus has replaced the old law, that is the Old Testament, the old covenant, with a new one, then why would we need to hang on to things of the old? Secondly, God gave the law of Moses to help guide the children of Israel. He didn't give it to Adam or Noah or even Abraham. He gave it to the Hebrews, the nation of Israel. So today, however, God's people are known as Christians, those who are of Christ, His Son. We are not Hebrews or Jewish nor Israelites. Therefore, we're not obligated or subject to that law. That is their law in any way. And so the Old Testament, that is the Old Covenant, was given specifically for them. But once again, why would anyone want to use and apply things from the old law, such as tithing or priestly clothing or anything else that is not commanded of the Christian? So yes, it's interesting that many will appeal to the Old Testament for approval of their religious practices, such as musical instruments or keeping the Sabbath or various ceremonial rituals, yet they don't keep all of the law which also includes practices such as animal sacrifices, returning to Jerusalem three times a year, and keeping all those Jewish holidays. Are these not reason enough to understand that that law is called the Old Testament? And lastly, the fact is, Jesus brought all of the laws from the Ten Commandments over into His new covenant, except for one, that is, keeping the Sabbath. You see, we're not permitted to kill or steal or commit adultery, just as it says in the Ten Commandments. We must still worship God and Him only, and we must still honor our parents. However, a Christian's obedience must come from the heart, not from a list of laws like the law of Moses. Remember what the Bible says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And there is no commandment greater than these. Mark 12, verses 30 through 31. And so, Christians are not under the Ten Commandments. Thanks, Troy. In Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse 31, Jeremiah prophesied that a new covenant would be coming to replace the old covenant the Israelites had, Israelites had broken. And that covenant included the Ten Commandments. That old law was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14. It vanished away, Hebrews 8.13. Check these things out for yourself in your own Bible. Here at Good News Today, we always want our audience to spend time in the Bible to see things for themselves. One way you can do that is by enrolling in our free Bible course. In just a moment, we'll give you our contact information so that you can send us your contact information. After that, Jim Dearman will join us. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today. P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at one 877 384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. The easiest way to enroll in our Bible course is on our website at gnttv.org. Just click where it says Bible course, fill out the information, and we'll mail it to you. While you're on our website, you can see videos of our current and archive programs there. There's sections for each of our segments so you can watch your favorites on demand. There may also be some segments from years gone by that you miss, you'd like to see again. We've got several of those in the section entitled Good News Today from Yesteryear. 
You can also enjoy us on Truth.fm, which is a channel that's dedicated to good news today. You'll hear programs there from all different eras. In addition, they have several other channels that contain excellent Bible teaching. Give them a listen at Truth.fm. Now here's Jim Dearman with some sound words for us about pursuing excellence. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. John Gardner said, The society which scorns excellence in plumbing, because plumbing is a humble activity, and tolerates shoddiness in philosophy, because it is an exalted activity, will have neither good plumbing nor good philosophy. Neither its pipes nor its theories will hold water. Well, you know, the Bible reminds us that we cannot please God by scorning excellence and tolerating shoddiness in our spiritual lives. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven admonishes us to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Our love must show itself in complete obedience to God's Word. Even then, Jesus reminds us, So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. That's Luke 17, 10. We cannot be slack in our service and still please the Savior. We must give to God and Christ our very best. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. Excellence in spiritual matters. That's what matters the most. Thanks for that, Jim. You can enjoy Jim's segments as well as any other of our segments in our apps, and they're available for free from the App Store. You can watch on demand, you can download items to your device, and even watch them when you're not connected. If you have a television that has a Roku built in, or if you have a Roku or Apple TV device attached to your television, we've got a channel for you. We've got hundreds of videos you can watch on demand right there on your TV. Well, it's time for us to head over to the pastime porch, where Joe Guy is waiting for us with another truth from the timeless text. He's going to be helping us armor our minds. Well, hello. Say, did uh, you know the word gullible can't be found in the dictionary? Now, for just a moment, did you believe that that was a possibility? Because if you do look in the dictionary, well, you'll not only find the word there, but you'll realize how easy it is to be gullible. If we're not careful, we can be fooled to believe or maybe just accept just about anything that we're told. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, Peter tells us to gird up the loins of your mind or to put armor around our minds by living soberly and resting our hope on the grace of Christ. Like children obeying a parent's instruction, we no longer conform ourselves to the world. Or as Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we're not conformed to the world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our minds by God's Word. We put protection around a lot of things. We have houses to protect us from rain and heat and cold. Our cars are built to protect us from those things as well as a crash. But we often neglect armoring our minds against the evil that's in the world. Shouldn't we trust the timeless text to armor our minds? and avoid being gullible to things that might sound believable but are actually untrue. Like, did you know that you can't say the word gullible and blink your eyes at the same time? Sure you can. I'm Joe Guy. Thank you for visiting. We protect ourselves in so many different ways. The way that's most important is to protect ourselves from sin. Thanks, Joe. If you ever have any questions you'd like to ask us, we're ready to open up the Bible and give you an answer. Send us a letter or an email with your question, and we'll get that answer to you. We may even do so during our program. If you'd like to listen to podcasts, we've got great news for you. Good News Today has three different podcasts. There's a new episode of Good News Today, Daily Devotional Time, that comes out every morning, and it's a great way to start your day in the Scriptures. On Sunday, that week's program is released as a podcast, called Good News Today Weekly. In addition, we have a podcast entitled Sound Words with Jim Dearman. All of these are available wherever you get your podcasts, so check us out. Now, Chad Dalahite joins us for just a minute, 
and he's encouraging us to do less interpretation and more imitation. May I have just a minute of your time? If my wife happened to send me a text one day saying, please pick up the kids on your way home, but I show up at the house empty-handed, I'm going to have to do some explaining. Now suppose I say, I just didn't interpret it that way. I interpreted it to mean something else. Would that solve the dilemma? Someone might say, well, Chad, that's ridiculous. No one could, under could misunderstand such plain talk. But look at what the religious world does with passages like, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. And, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, John 3, 5. Or what about this? There is one body, Ephesians 4, 4, and many other passages we could give. While there are obviously some passages that are more difficult, God's plans for the church and our salvation need a lot less interpretation and a lot more imitation. Remember Psalm 119, verse 160. The entirety of your word is truth. I'm Chad Dalahat, and this is Just a Minute. I've heard it said, when all is said and done, a lot more gets said than gets done. There's wisdom in that. In just a moment, we'll give our Bible question to Guyton and Troy. Now we have a Bible question for Guyton and Troy. Why did God allow King David to marry Bathsheba after committing adultery and premeditated murder? Troy, I got a question for you. What do you have today, Guyton? Has there ever been something that you did in your life that just seems to plague you that you wish you could go back and just change it? Oh yeah, I think everybody has that. You know, something that if you could go back and say it differently or do it differently, you certainly would. And I'd certainly have that. Yeah, you know, some people even call it regrets. Yeah, right. You know, and I, and, and some people want to say, well, I want those regrets to be taken away. Hmm. Well, the consequences of our sins can be taken away, uh, but yet the the remorse that we feel, I uh, think, will always be there to some degree. And I think it's a good thing because it, you learn from your mistakes. You learn, and and that's a reminder of the beautiful forgiveness that we have through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Exactly. Now, I'm going to come back to why I introduced it that way in okay. a minute. But the question that we have today wants to know, why was King David allowed to take Bathsheba to wife after he had murdered the uh, her husband, mm. Uriah, and had committed the sin of adultery and conceived a child with her? Why would, why would God allow her to allow him to go ahead and take her to wife. Well, I think the question is interesting, but uh, you, you got to think about the way it said, why would God allow? Well, there's a whole lot there. People say that a lot of times, you know, why would God allow? Well, the straight answer is we live in a dark and fallen world, in a sinful world, and we have free choice. And so God, what God allows is for us to make our own decisions. God didn't allow the sin. He allowed us to make the decision of what might turn into sin. Now, marriage is certainly that, you know, it's for this world. Yeah. It's, and so when one loses a spouse, they are now free to be able mm -hmm. to be remarried. And so, you know, at the time, Bathsheba was qualified, even though that she had committed the sin of adultery, she could be married because her husband was dead. And some would say, well, that just seems to be unfair. But also think about it from this perspective. As a widowed woman, it would be harder for her to be able to find a husband, first mm -hmm. of all. Mm -hmm. Secondly, for 
people to know of the adulterous situation, it would have been almost impossible for her to find a husband that would be willing to take her. Mm -hmm. And so I can't help but wonder, was this kind of an act of mercy from David as well, dealing with that remorse, understanding what he had done, that he had put this woman in this situation, and now I need to take care of her. That's a good point. You know, I've never thought of it that way, but, uh, you know, he's dealing with some sin that in his, in his life. And here's the thing I often think about is why is that in there? You know, why did God decide to preserve that in the text? I think it's to teach us a very valuable lesson. Yeah. Well, I mean, you take with David, um, he's, he's described in scripture as a man after God's own heart. Exactly. But yet he still is able to get to this point in sin. And doesn't that give us hope that even somebody like him, that God can forgive or that he still seeks after God becomes a great example for us? You're, you're exactly right. Now, what is important in all this account is David's attitude because in 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, it's whenever he speaks to Nathan, it says, David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Mm. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin thou shalt not die. Wow. And so there was this forgiveness, but going back to the introduction, you know, go and read the Psalms and you can see that David, the way he describes himself and the remorse, the regret, I think he lived with the rest of his life. So for somebody that says, man, he gets off scot-free. Well, two things on that one, um, we all get off scot-free whenever we find (laughs) forgiveness in Christ and we ought to be grateful. So, amen. you know, be careful about judging him on Mm -hmm. it. Uh, two, I don't believe he ever truly washed his hands of the situation when you read the Psalms. There was yeah. always remorse and regret. So why did God allow it? Um, because God allowed it. Now, that might not be the best answer for some people, but uh, it's what we see that he allowed to happen. And I do believe it could be a, a noble, righteous thing that David did by going and taking Bathsheba. Amen. In this episode, we've covered some very good material from the Old Testament, but we encourage you, make sure you use your Old Testament properly. There's things we learn about God and His plan, but those commandments are not for us today. We encourage you to always check all religious teaching against the Word of God. See if these things are true. You can watch or listen to our program again, have some extra time to check the Scriptures. You can hear it or get to our uh, transcript on our website or on our apps. If you have a question, contact us. We'd love to hear from you. Remember, we love you, we're praying for you, and we want you to make it to heaven.